All right, all right. So, pretty good audience here. Uh, I hope you are. We are already half an hour late, and I hope you are not feeling hungry. Uh, that this is going to take another half an hour or so. Uh, so stay hungry. All right, let's get started. I'll skip the bio. You can take a look at it later in the slides when that will be shared with you. The agenda of this, uh, the next half an hour is that I want to discuss about uh, lake house architecture, which has uh, uh, become very popular lately. And Pavan also mentioned it briefly. Um, and then uh, I want to come to the challenges with processing streaming data on data lake um, and uh, some solutions uh, with Flink and Kafka on Hudi. Um, and then Hoodie as a lake house platform, that's, a, that's what I will be spending maximum time on. Um, why, why I would like to argue why, first of all, you need a lake house architecture. And second, why Hoodie as a lake house platform uh, would uh, satisfy most of your use cases. All right. Uh, so lake house architecture, right? So um, in the first session, Pawan mentioned uh, uh, about you know recomputing uh, data, and that could take uh, hours. It's uh, not a made-up thing. It's uh, it has actually happened previously at Uber um, back in 2015-16 when Uber was in hyper growth phase and uh, opening up everywhere in every city. Um, they move. Uh, they, they basically so. The, they maintain a trips database uh, of all the rides that ever happened on Uber. And uh, every at that point of time, it was 120 TB. Right now, Uber's uh, data lake is at uh, 200 petabytes or something. Um, and the, even though out of that 120 TB, actual change in data was less than half TB. That's even less than 0.5%, right? So. They were still recomputing it, fully recomputing the whole data, and that took about eight hours. So this batch PTL was clearly not scalable, and 120 TB was not going to remain constant. It was uh, increasing every day. So they, the problems that they faced was uh, ingest latency was quite high, and uh, they were actually doing very wasteful reading and writing. Uh, see, uh, you are fully recomputing 120 TB of data, even though actual change is just 0.5 TB. Um, you are wasting your I/O basically. And uh, the other part is so one is uh, doing incremental changes. The other part is how do you, uh, uh, if you are operating at uh, a very high scale, you have multiple writers, concurrent readers um, accessing your data. How do you ensure concurrency control? In short, how do you guarantee acid semantics on top of your uh, data? So warehouse was one solution for sure, but warehouse was not a very scalable solution. Um, so they moved to lake, but then again, these problems uh, that come with data management, the classic problems, they stayed as is. And that's when uh, Uber developed an open source <coughs> framework called Apache Hoodie. And uh, we'll see how Woody addresses some of these issues. Um, but on a high level, essentially, Woody is like this database kernel on top of your data lake. And it uh, lets you run ingestion in near real time. So there is a difference between real time and near real time. Uh, real time, you would expect something uh, in the order of seconds. Um, if you're talking about transactional databases, that's even less than a second. Um, but near real time is something in the order of few minutes, maybe just uh, one minute to five minute latency. Uh, latency between what? Latency between the time when event happened and the time when you are processing the data. Um, and there are certain built in table services uh, within Hudi, which uh, helps you, uh, the, these services run in the background. It helps you to optimize the layout of your data. Uh, We'll see what, what do we mean by layout optimization soon. Um, but kudos to the terminology. So Hoodie originated in about 2016. Yeah, right. So it was open sourced in 2016. But this lake house terminology, we are still calling then uh, uh, near real time incremental processing. 
uh, even hoodie h u d i uh, stands for hadoop absurds incrementals and deletes uh, so but but, but um, databricks released a big house paper and uh, essentially uh, if you think about it it's a merger of um, uh, data lakes and data warehouse uh, and uh, this diagram is directly from that paper it's a good paper anyway everyone should read it uh, so those those were the first generation platforms uh, you had structured data uh, you would etl into warehouse and uh, then um, analysts would be able to access it second generation was two tier architecture uh, you could dump all your any kind of unstructured semi structured structured data on data lake which is again the foundation for that is the object storage systems uh, and then run etl into warehouses so that it is uh, queryable what made warehouses special was that they actually even today i, I think snowflake um, uh, it's a very beautiful experience even today uh, they optimized uh, your data layout in such a way that uh, any queries that you run, they are very, very efficient. Uh, what are those optimizations? We'll come to that. Uh, what do Lakehouse platforms do? Uh, all right, so what if we could build all these different uh, database components, um, indexing, caching directly on top of data lakes, uh, like UG database systems, right? U, uh, UG syllabus database systems, all those things, Lakehouse platforms is trying to bring directly on top of Lake. Bringing that on top of Lake has its own challenges, but yeah, that's what the vision is. That what if we could do that? Then we can eliminate the need for this two-tier architecture. And why would you want to eliminate that need? Well, let's face it. Whoever has been data engineer for a large-scale company, if you have been on call, uh, it's a nightmare. Uh, even today. Um, I, there is so much VC money flowing around just simplifying this experience. Um, so two-tier data architecture with, by two-tier basically lake and then warehouse, it, it's an operational burden for sure. Um, apart from that, there is an issue of uh, data freshness. Uh, so data fresh, the warehouses uh, offer you consistency and isolation, but that comes at the cost of freshness. Um, your by freshness, I mean there is always there will always be a lag between the time when that event was generated and the time when that event is processed. Uh, and this lag is uh, slightly lower for streaming systems. Um, but uh, as you uh, in two tier architecture, it's uh, higher. Uh, then uh, support for machine learning data science use cases directly on top of Lake. And I think that's where uh, uh, Apache Spark and uh, its vendor Databricks excel. Um, uh, at its core, MLDS applications also uh, face the same kind of data management problems like your usual applications. And then it goes without saying that performance matters, whether you have a two-tier architecture or you eliminate the need for warehouses. Performance is critical, right? So. Um, the storage layout optimization and ability to efficiently. So if let's say half TB of data is only being updated, where is that half TB of data? Where does that reside? Which file is exactly holding this record? How, how do you tell that, right? If you don't have, if you don't maintain some kind of metadata, if you don't maintain some kind of index, um, yeah, it's, it's gonna be a nightmare. And uh, that's why people used to recompute um, uh, in, in the traditional architecture. Um, all right, so let's see. Now I want to talk about streaming on data lake, in particular change log streams. So CDC, um, um, Chetan already talked about it. Um, even here, the solution that I'll be presenting is very much similar to that. Uh, uh, but uh, the point that I want to highlight why CDC streams are challenging. Uh, see, your transactional databases they can have, uh, theoretically, uh, the data in transactional database cannot grow, and yet the number of CDC events will keep growing. Let's say you never ever had uh, any new inserts coming. You just did a bulk load of data, and uh, all our updates, all those updates are CDC events. So the events, the write-ahead logs, those keep on growing. 
even though your uh, actual data size has not grown, right? Um, so so th that's about CDC and then ability to process that in a streaming fashion. Stream has its own, own uh, challenges. Forget about CDC, processing unbounded data, uh, the always on nature of stream, it is never shut down, right? Uh, it has its own challenges. So the simplest way would be to pick each and every CDC event and then just uh, write it to uh, some some file, right? Uh, but keep it immutable. Um, you you the, the the simplicity what what it does for you is that you don't need to really locate where the if if you're not handling updates then you don't need to figure out where my record is located, right? And then CDC uh, events always contain some uh, event sequence number or log sequence number uh, through which you can order the events. But there is a problem there. Um, your number of files, uh, data files or data blocks to be more granular, they will keep growing indefinitely. Uh, there are solutions to that as well. Uh, people manually compact data, uh, run something in the background or cluster the data. Uh, let's say you know your access pattern that most frequently your end users are going to query by certain fields. Your table might have thousands of columns but at the end of the day it's going to be queried by only a handful of columns then you can always cluster your data by those uh, columns and uh, organize the data in such a way that at least for 95 percent of the queries uh, you don't have to scan all this uh, huge number of small files so that's uh, those are the challenges another challenge is materialization but this is very specific to flink um show of hands how many here have used flink contributed to flink uh nice all right so we have two people in the black there so dynamic table is uh, an api provided by flink which gives you very nice uh, uh sql like capabilities directly on top of stream and I think in um, the Kafka ecosystem, there is something called KSQL as well. Uh, but the issue with dynamic tables is that you cannot actually realize that data. As in, you can sure query over the stream and Flink has its own uh, uh, concepts of, or any streaming system for that matter, watermarking and windowing. Uh, but if you really want to be able to make that available to the end user directly, uh, it's it's a very hard problem. Um, then again, dynamic tables cannot be shared among jobs. So Flink Engine uh, does maintain some state in, in its backend, um, but each dynamic table is um, all dynamic tables are isolated from each other, so they they cannot be shared among jobs. And it does not maintain any versions. Uh, anyone from uh, who has used Postgres or uh, contributed to Postgres? Yeah. So Postgres uh, has has this. I think it was one of the first uh, uh, databases to offer true snapshot isolation, uh, maintaining multiple versions of data. Right. So th those things are not possible with dynamic table. Another challenge is uh, in order to avoid fully recomputing data, you need to be able to pick up changes from what happened since I last processed the data. The, that is what is called incremental ETL. And you don't want to be processing the same data again and again. At the same time, maintain this order. So this twin challenge of exactly once as well as uh, in order uh, uh, events. Again, it's not easy to solve. Uh, Kafka has done a pretty good job at it, um, but these are the hard challenges of uh, uh, dealing with streams. Um, and uh, I think streaming ecosystem is still uh, there is a research going on among major database communities how to handle. It. I think I got disconnected. Let me reconnect. Yeah, so. This might take some time, um, but it's a very interesting domain. It's a very interesting domain, and uh, if anything, I want uh, 
even if you don't take anything from this talk i want everyone to just uh, fork some some open source uh, framework and start contributing to it um that would be if, if this if through this meetup if we can achieve that uh, yeah uh, that would be amazing okay yeah uh, uh, can you repeat your question Let's again the concept of that like yeah it is here so essentially it's uh, about managing offset managing checkpoints in some way if you can maintain um, uh, what was the last data that i looked at uh, uh, and then compare the incoming uh, records with uh, the checkpoint then you can uh, ensure that uh, you are your ingestion is idempotent uh, the checkpoints can differ the, that management part can differ by different frameworks but at the end of the day it's just a mark over your your stream is flowing and then it's just a mark over your stream up to what point uh, um, i have processed this stream um, so very briefly uh, 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 with flink and kafka uh, uh, how we can solve this this architecture is very similar to uh, what chaitanya was talking about and uh, uh, essentially you start with a tra transactional database like postgres and uh, devisium is hugely popular today uh, to process all these change logs um, uh, the right ahead logs from the databases um, uh, for kafka connector devisium plugin devisium postgres connector is written which is a plugin for the kafka connect and uh, that uh, so through that you can process events in, into a flink pipeline create a dynamic table in flink pipeline materialize that to a um, hudi table uh, and then uh, it could be presto or it could be trino or anything you can use uh, spark sql uh, any any analytics engine also you can use to query hudi tables uh, hudi by design is interoperable with uh, several query engines uh, so what what makes uh, so what are the unique things here uh, hudi has this indexing layer indexing component uh, which uh, tells uh, where is your uh, where is your record located hudi maintains an invariant that a particular uh, record hudi has a notion of uh, key as well uh, just like your traditional databases not many open source table formats like delta lake or uh, iceberg have this notion of uh, primary key but hudi has this and um, down the line it um, it helps you a lot uh, you you may have to invest some time in the beginning to think about your schema to think about your data model but once you have done that it eases a lot for you uh, so this index layer tells hudi uh, where where uh, uh, fine i have some data coming from source um hudi will run through the index layer and figure out whether it's an insert and update if it's an update where exactly that um, record is located i'll come back to what are these fg123 there is a notion of file group and file slices in hudi um but at its core it's essentially maintaining multiple versions of data whatever uh, changed um for a particular record that is there um with hudi flink integration uh, what we did here is that um, this record level index were uh, the, the instead of uh, uh, so the, in case of hudi flink it is maintained in um, I, i mentioned flink has a backend right so it could be in memory uh, or you could use rocks db uh, which is very popular um, so this index is maintained there and whenever there is some something coming from the data source uh in this case it would be uh, let's say events coming from some kafka topic uh there is a bucket assigner uh which figures out okay this particular record goes to which bucket and then uh, the stream writer uh, is able to route the records to a particular file um to be more precise i should say file group 
but let's let's assume that uh, we just have files. Uh, in the background, uh, we'll have cleaning and compaction running. Now, if you maintain different versions of data, your uh, number of files again uh, uh, it, it's gonna grow. So, uh, how do you how do you eliminate older data? Uh, you know that uh, okay. Uh, First, why would you want to eliminate older data? Storage is so cheap. Why would you want to do that, right? Um, well, I think uh, if, if you uh, keep, it, it's just a maintenance overhead, um, uh, keeping uh, more than certain amount of data, it does not, uh, it, you have to figure out from your business use case up to what amount of data I, uh, or what amount of late arriving data I can handle. Uh, later arriving data is that event had happened sometime in past. Uh, you have actually processed events later than when that event happened, and then that event is arriving now. Um, so it, 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 you need to have some tolerance for late arriving data, and then you can clean your records. Compaction is where you uh, compact uh, different versions of data to produce the latest snapshot of the data. Um, so all these are pretty much automatic with Hoodie. Um, again, with materialization, uh, Hoodie table, uh, um, you can, Hoodie provides uh, some uh, file system view APIs, uh, which can help you query the data, uh, not just the latest snapshot, but any previous point in time, uh, you can do time travel queries. Hoodie has this notion of event time sequence. Um, in Hoodie terminology, we call it pre-combined key. Uh, you, you can configure any column to be your pre-combined key. In case of CDC, most likely that's the LSN column, uh, log sequence number column, and then order your events by that. You can, do, uh, so the checkpoint that is maintained in Hoodie, uh, uh, it's essentially the commit when uh, Hoodie timeline looks like a timestamp. Uh, it maintains three things. First, what kind of operation is this? As I talked about, there is compaction cleaning, and then there is a regular commit, regular ingestion commit, right? So Hoodie timeline maintains a state about what kind of operation is being done on the table, when it is being done on the table, and whether it is uh, in flight or uh, it has completed. So this event timeline serves as an event log, and uh, that kind of helps with a lot of things in the. In this case, with incremental ETL, uh, we are able to figure out what, what's the new data um, and what we need to process actually. But the timeline also helps with concurrency control. I'm not gonna go deep into concurrency control in this talk, uh, maybe some other time. Uh, the the main, main point being that if you maintain some event log uh, and maintain some key, you can do a whole lot of things. Uh, so, have, uh, a show of hands, who has heard of Medallion architecture? Uh, it's nothing new. Uh, well, uh, you want to maintain uh, some layer where you just ingest raw events and then process it to uh, silver layer where you have applied some transformation. And then gold layer is like um, uh, data that, uh, let's say, analysts or on which uh, analysts will query or BI reports will be prepared, executive reports will be prepared, right? So the medallion architecture is this, uh, uh, essentially data flows from raw to silver to gold, and in between you can do your transformation. Uh, if there was no incremental ETL, this would recompute all of ingest at each and every layer, raw, silver, and gold. Due to incremental ETL and Flink's streaming capabilities. Uh, the, this barely takes, it could be anywhere between few seconds to few minutes. And I'm talking about uh, scale of uh, something in terabytes or petabytes, uh, hundreds of terabytes or uh, low petabytes. Of course, you, if you have more and more data coming, uh, uh, that latency will increase. Um, so yeah, the, the, this is about incremental ETL with Hoodie. Let's quickly run through Hoodie as a lake house platform. What does Hoodie do? As usual, uh, at the base, you have your lake storage, HDFS or S3. Then your data is being written in open formats like Parquet, Avro, or H file. 
uh, then on the top you have your analytical engines to query the data. What Hoodie provides in between is this uh, database layer, uh, which stores uh, metadata for your data, which handles uh, uh, deals with concurrency control, uh, so that you can have multiple writers writing to the same table, multiple readers reading from the same table. Uh, how to handle those uh, uh, read, write, write, write conflicts? Um, uh, it, it runs stable services in the background. You just need to configure three or four con uh, configs, um, and then uh, it will automatically compact your data, cluster your data. It does automatic file sizing. If you are uh, uh, even writing, let's say your use case is you are writing immutable files, uh, then um, uh, it uh, will automatically compact those files in the background. And uh, the way the core of this is the concept of file group and file slices. So when um, Hoodie writes a record, it writes uh, a base file. Most likely it will be some columnar file uh, in Parquet or uh, Ork. Um, and then uh, whenever there are new updates, remember I talked about the invariant that a Hoodie key can only go to one particular file group. So base file has a file ID. Um, and whenever there is a new uh, update comes that belongs to the record as part of that file ID, we create a log file. Uh, and that's why you see this here, file group one, you have different file slices because all those base file combined with different versions or different updates that happened on the records contained in that particular file group, they comprise file slice. And these file slices are marked by the timestamp when the commit happened. So let's say you want to uh, run a query select ABC from some table as of instant this. Hoodie uh, is able to figure out what was the snapshot at that point in time and then just uh, scan only those files, skip other files. All of this is, by the way, maintained in metadata table. Uh, the, the different indexes are maintained in metadata table. An interesting bit is this is again a hoodie table inside a hoodie table. Um, yeah, uh, so the it is not it is written in H file. Uh, I won't go into the details of why we chose H file to write the index, but essentially the same concepts that apply on hoodie table apply on the metadata table as well. Um, file group structure for uh, I'll probably skip this slide, but very briefly. The log files uh, uh, contain data blocks uh, of whenever update happened. Or let's say you did a rollback, you restored the table to some previous point in time, then it will contain rollback blocks and our scanner will skip. Uh, as in, depending on the block type, it will decide whether to skip this block or whether to skip this block for, for returning an iterator of records. Uh, the indexing subsystem that we have in Hoodie, as I said, it's a, an internal Hoodie merge on read table. Um, the records, whenever the new records are incoming, uh, you can either, there are two ways you can index the data. Again, those coming from the Postgres might be more familiar with it. You can do synchronous updates to the index as and when a new batch of uh, ingest arrives, you go ahead and uh, update. Uh, before doing the commit on the data table, you go ahead and update the metadata table and your uh, commit waits, um, so the data table commit waits until this metadata table update is finished, and then uh, it returns. Uh, other is asynchronous indexing. Um, so in Postgres, uh, you have the ability to concurrently index your data. Um, so it's async indexer can keep running in the background and identify what updates are happening and accordingly update metadata table. Uh, there are trade-offs between the two approach, um, uh, essentially related to uh, consistency guarantees. Uh, but uh, if you have a very huge data lake and uh, your each batch is so big that you don't want your updates to wait, then let the async indexer run in the background. It will eventually update your metadata table. There will never, by the way, there will never be data correctness issue. Uh, even if you are uh, running async indexer, there will never be correctness issue. At the worst case, your latency might increase a bit when you're querying the data because it will uh, fall back to listing the files directly from uh, directly doing a file system call. 
uh, instead of uh, if something is not available in the metadata table, it will fall back to listing through file system call. Uh, so what does Hoodie Tech Stack look uh, on uh, cloud? You have different kinds of data sources. Um, and then on this end, you have different tools to query the data, different platforms here to query the data. In between, uh, uh, your Lakehouse platform would look something like this. Uh, there is storage on top of which Hoodie provides you asset guarantees, uh, incremental ETL capabilities, managed table services like compaction clustering, and multimodal index, which we just discussed. So our uh, roadmap, uh, and, and I'm looking for more and more contributors here from India. Um, we want to have first class support for CDC data. Record level index that we talked about, um, we want to be make it available at both global level as well as the partition level. Um, if your data is partitioned, we, want, we are building new set of um, table and merge APIs, uh, which will make it easier to integrate with uh, readers, different different engines basically um engines such as uh, presto or spark um, and then uh, first class support for unstructured data uh, the community is thinking about ways of how to process uh, images and videos which has become so, so crucial for the machine learning community uh, how, how can we offer same capabilities that uh, capabilities such as indexing and capturing the uh, CDC events, how can we offer those, not necessarily CDC, capturing any kind of change. So the, the, this pull request uh, will take you to the RFC where we are having this discussion. Uh, interesting uh, set of comments there. Um, these are some good resources I have uh, segregated by colors. So the first two are like uh, uh, one of the best uh, written blogs. The, those two are by Tyler Akido, who uh, kind of, you know, uh, when streaming was really nothing that time, uh, he worked on it and developed some primitives to handle uh, unbounded data. Uh, the red ones are uh, more talking about CDC and its handling with Hoodie. Uh, the green ones are uh, about uh, Hoodie's vision and certain core concepts if you want to learn uh, in more detail and our community has been growing phenomenally since 2020 um, i would love uh, if more people from uh, india can contribute and uh, join uh, uh, engage with our community we do weekly uh, calls um, office hours um, discuss food issues and yeah that's it that's all i had any questions Yeah. How is it different than other index? Uh, okay. So there is data table, then there is metadata table which maintains the index. You can have two ways about it. Uh, you, um, when you start ingesting and uh, want to write some update on data table, you first update the metadata table, and then commit on the data can table. The, kind of two phases. Like in Java, they say that concurrent has matching. They say that. You can get a stale data yeah. because in some segment the data is not always correct data. Then concurrent indexing in this Hoodie framework also means the same thing. You can get the stale data, you can always have the fresh data. Not exactly the same thing, uh, but uh, you'll you won't get stale data. Your latencies might be affected, so that's a design choice that we made. Um, you you'll always get whatever has been committed on the data table but the commit on the data table can either be blocked until the commit on the metadata table has happened or it can be non-blocking uh, if it is non-blocking in case of concurrent indexing then we fall back to uh, listing the actual data from the file system so actual fs calls file system calls uh, instead of uh, uh, looking up at index. So latency increases there, but you won't ever, there will never be data correctness issue. So that's one of the design goals. Uh, some, some framework might choose uh, um, uh, like uh, eventual consistency paradigms. Um, they, they might uh, forego uh, uh, certain things. Um, 
so that's kind of design trade offs uh, we, we always went for uh, having uh, not to compromise on data correctness yes yeah 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 yes hdfs s3 yeah why not azure blob azure blob oh, yeah it's there i think we uh, azure adls uh, uh, i think azure data lake generations 2 huh? adls gen 2 yeah 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 it's just that that triple dots uh, yeah i'm i should have mentioned it yeah 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 it's, uh, so your lake storage could be on anything uh, it, Yes. Uh, how do you ensure? Oh, that's an interesting question. So for the online audience, the question is that um, for CDC events, um, a, a log sequence number kind of becomes an event ordering field. Uh, but how do you ensure that's monotonically increasing? So let me. Um, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there will be clock skew. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. So um, we use, uh, um, I can give you an example of uh, what we do for Spark. Uh, uh, well, uh, the processing, yeah, Apache Spark, uh, the processing that is done by Hoodie, uh, Hoodie, Hoodie presents this uh, transactional layer, right? But then delegates the processing of data, the actual compute that's happening to the engine. It could be Flink or it could be Spark. Um, so there we utilize to ensure uh, uh, that uh, event uh, ordering field is always monotonically increasing. Uh, we utilize uh, engine's uh, uh, nuances, such as for Spark, it will always allocate some uh, stage ID. Uh, for any job, it will allocate some stage ID, some partition ID, uh, task partition ID. Those, uh, uh, Spark itself uh, uh, keeps them uh, monotonically increasing. As and when jobs are. Yeah. 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 So somewhere, so th there, there has to be a coordinator which is submitting that job. And uh, if I could show you the file name that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I was. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to show you the file name that Hoodie creates. It has a write token uh, apart from the file ID that's more like UUID. But that write token is kind of assigned by a coordinator which acts at a global level. And uh, write token is always monotonically increasing, uh, but depending on. Uh, uh, the writers, when 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 those uh, data arrive, the whenever the writer is uh, asking Hoodie to ingest this data, so that's the when that's the time when those write tokens are assigned, and uh, they are kind of uh, atomically increasing integer. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So the. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So there is no. Uh, uh, even for uh, Kafka, I think. Um, like theoretical guarantees on exactly processing the it's it does not exist. Essentially, what they say that for you, the perception will be that it's exactly once processed. 
but it's not actually exactly once uh, processed. So that's kind of uh, uh, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah. Hey, uh, thank you so much for all the questions, but we'll take the rest of the questions offline. We'll have a short 10-minute uh, uh, networking break. Uh, so thank you, Sagar, for such a wonderful uh, interview. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.